hiring, hiring and guiding a project and or general manager with Bill Gessner and Carolee Coulter. This is Marilyn Scholl with CDS Consulting Co-op. We're happy to have you here today in the last of our series on starting a food co-op, What You Need to Know. All of the sessions in this series are now available uh, online through a recorded session as well as all the materials that were presented. You can find those by going to our website, CDS Consulting Co-op, and looking under the News and Events section. Um, if you want to participate in today's uh, session by asking a question, type your question into the uh, question box on the right, and when we get to a, a time for stopping, we'll give you a chance to ask your question by unmuting your line and letting you ask your question. So let's get started. Um, Bill and Carolee, take it away. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today uh, for session six of our six webinars here in 2010. And uh, I think some of you have been with us for all six sessions. Uh, thank you very much. And those just joining us today, welcome. Um, I'll be presenting along with Carolee Coulter. And uh, our agenda for today um, is sketched out here. Um, we'll look a little bit at some of the W's, the what, why, when, and who to hire. Uh, and then uh, Carol Lee will talk about an overview of the hiring process. And then we will look at some of the special aspects of promoting and recruiting and uh, have time for questions and discussion at the end. Uh, we also hope to have time for questions uh, during each of the sections here, at least at the, at the end of each of our sections. So I uh, hope to involve you and hear from you. Our um, desired outcome uh, today centers around uh, having an understanding of when you should begin planning to hire, uh, what you should look for in hiring a project manager or a general manager, uh, what is involved in the hiring process for a general manager, and the importance of and some tools for promotion and recruitment. So there's a very uh, valuable resource that is available. Um, and uh, Carolee, do you want to just um, say hello here to everybody and speak for a moment about this? Yes. The National Cooperative Grocers Association publishes a series of what they call the Toolbox Series. And one of them is a workbook called Hiring a General Manager that is specifically written for boards of directors of natural food retail co-ops on how to hire a general manager. Of course, uh, most of the information is geared towards established co-ops, but most of it should be relevant for startups. And there are a few tips for startups along the way, which we will also discuss today. At several points today, we'll mention the workbook and say, you can get more detail about this from the workbook. And so we highly recommend that um, if, when you're getting ready to purchase, uh, sorry, getting ready to hire a general manager, that you purchase this workbook from the National Cooperative Grocers Association. And who uh, authored the workbook, Carolee? Uh, oh, that would be myself. OK, thank you. And uh, so uh, as we begin each of the webinars that I've been on, I, we come back and look at the uh, four cornerstones and three stages development model that I think can be a useful model for your startup co-ops. And we'll look at this today in the context of when to hire. Um, and we see the four cornerstones of vision, talent, capital, and systems. And we see within those cornerstones the three stages, the organizing stage one, stage two, feasibility and planning, stage three, implementation. Uh, the cornerstone of talent is certainly one that is we're focusing on today in terms of uh, hiring a, a project manager and hiring a general manager. As we look at an overview of the three stages, uh, what's important with this illustration are the two lines that you see. Uh, the dotted line and the solid line, and understanding the difference there, that the dotted line represents at the end of stage 2B represents a time when you would secure your site contingent upon 
getting financing and then moving into stage 3A, the pre-construction work where you finalize your design work and get all of your financing in place. And at the end of stage 3A, you remove the contingencies from your lease agreement or your purchase agreement. And you make it the final decision point. Once you cross over that solid line, there's no turning back. So understanding those two key decision points at the end of stage 2B and at the end of stage 3A. And looking at the three stages again in terms of a time frame, we can see roughly how long what might it might take you to work through these stages. Um, and we'll come back and look at this a little bit uh, further. Um, uh, we, we want to look at uh, around the cornerstone of talent as you're trying to assemble talent to help you through the process and get you positioned to be a, for success. Um, that you will be, there will be a number of components here. There will be the champion or the champions of your effort. And th this is kind of an unusual role or a title, but it's, it's never formally elected or formally designated, but the champion typically emerges in a project. Um, usually it's one person, sometimes it's shared, but uh, the champion will kind of see the project through, uh, through all the hurdles and, and the, the obstacles, et cetera. Uh, the champion is there uh, advocating and, and uh, you know, promoting the co-op and working to, for its success. A steering committee, a task force, or a founding team, the board of directors, um, and there are developers, consultants, peers, uh, external to the co-op, external stakeholders, and then management, uh, talking about project manager and general manager and staff. When we talk about project managers here, you see the reference to two different types. We usually don't use those long titles, but they kind of s signify that the development project manager might be more focused on helping you get organized and with your overall development through the three stages. The facility project manager is more focused on coordination related to the site, related to the design work and planning and preparing for construction and the actual construction process. So when we look at the W's here, we'll look at what and why, uh, hiring a project manager, and hiring a general manager. What are you, those, that's the what and why would you be hiring these people? Um, hiring a project manager to provide leadership, coordination, professional expertise, and to assist with um, organizing process and or planning implementation for a site. Hiring a general manager uh, to provide leadership, coordination, and professional expertise. Again, prepare a plan for store opening, hire and train staff, develop organizational and store operating systems. So when do you hire? Uh, it depends on your resources. It depends on how serious you are, how committed you are, how far along the timeline you are, how likely you are going to be able to get to opening a store. But hiring a project manager as soon as possible, you know, in stage one if possible, you know, how do you get the funds to pay for that is another question. Um, hiring a general manager, the guideline would be, I would say, at least six months before opening. Uh, Twelve months would be even better. Um, making good hires can bring momentum, professionalism, accountability, and progress to your startup project. And if we go back and look at the timeline here, we can see that in, in stage one, uh, we could be hiring a project manager in stage one, or if they're, especially if their focus is around organizing, if their focus is more around the facility, you would be hiring them perhaps more in stage 2B, and they would continue through 2B through the opening of the store. 
the hiring of the general manager is is uh, always a challenge as to figure out when to do that because you you don't know that you're across that final decision point. Um, it's not until you've crossed that final decision point that you would have all your resources together and you know for sure you're going to be opening your store. So uh, Jill, can I interject something here? Please. Um, from the testimony of talking to some general managers of startups, I would say that um, hiring the general manager um, before, you know, certainly by the start of 3B is good. Uh, when I, I once talked to a general manager who was hired just three weeks before the store opened, and he inherited things that he would have chosen differently that proved not to work well, that had to be redone. And you know, I've also talked to general managers of startups who got to be there through that whole process from 3B on, and it definitely worked much better for them because they got to, they had a voice in making the decisions that they would then have to live with and operate. Right. Yes, that's a very good point. So the idea of having a general manager on board at least six months before opening, uh, in the case that stage 3B was only three months, you know, that would be, that would be too little time. And so there are cases where I would like to see a general manager on board in stage 2B, you know. And now that's well before you know that you're going to be guaranteed uh, opening a store, but you may be able to pull together the resources, you may be able to attract a suitable candidate, and if you can, and get them on board during stage 2B or stage 3A, you're even going to be better positioned. So that's uh, kind of an overview of, of the when, but again, the guideline of hiring a general manager at least six months before opening. So. Um, If we look at who, um, there, there takes some work to really determine who you're going to hire and what qualities you want them to have, what skills and what talents and what experience you want them to have. Um, you want them to have talents, but you want them to have talents that are a good match for your, your needs and your organization. And so part of the hiring process is determining their talents and determining of whether they will be a match for your, you, your organization and your situation. Um, experience in natural foods, grocery, or gro the broader category of grocery, or even the broader category of retail, all of those are very highly desired. Uh, experience in food co-ops can be important. When I look around at the startup co-ops that have opened, um, most all of them that I can think of, or I'm thinking of, you know, five or six that have all had attracted uh, a candidate who had experience, managerial, general manager experience with the food co-op. Um, I'm sure there are exceptions. Um, the experience that you, for a project manager, you know, you want them to have good organizing and communication skills, and if they're to be focused on the site, you want them to have strong experience with commercial building trades. Uh, general manager, um, there's a broad array of skills that you would want them to have, but certainly central and core are management and communication skills, including team building and supervision. Later on, Carol E. will talk about a kind of a worksheet that she's developed that helps you, uh, your board or your, your core team, assess the qualities that they're looking for in a general manager. So when you, when you look at what a good hire is, whether it be a project manager or a general manager, um, what is a good hire worth? And, and I think I encourage you to ask yourselves that question because certainly you have to pay for the talent. But if you make a good decision, what is that, um, what is that decision worth to your organization long term? And down at the bottom, for number one, I can say that the answer for hiring a good general manager, um, the way I think of it is, you know, that's a million-dollar decision, and it's worth that uh, to your co-op long term. Um, 
similarly, or on the other side of the coin, what is a what is a bad hire cost um, your organization in terms of actual lost dollars, in terms of lost opportunity? Uh, it's it's huge, and a mediocre hire has a cost to it as well. So if you're attracting, going through a hiring process and you have candidates and you're not too excited about them, but boy, you worked hard to recruit them and, well, you think maybe you should take the, the best of these mediocre candidates, um, there's a cost to that. And maybe it would be best for you to extend your hiring process and, you know, search for the better, the better candidate. You should have expectations for a high level of payback. Uh, for as you invest in a talented general manager and project manager. Uh, hiring a project manager you sh should bring you definite payback, both from an organizational communication point of view and also the facilities project manager. It will save you money long term. So, um, Carly, do you have anything to add in, in this area? Well, I, I want to second what you say about um, not settling for someone that you feel unenthusiastic about. Like, well, this is the best we could find. This is the only person, or th these are the only candidates we could get. It, even though it may delay your timeline, it would be better to go back and try more advertising, perhaps in some different venues, than to settle for a candidate that you feel dubious about at best. Uh, let's talk just a moment here about uh, project manager. We're, uh, much of our discussion today is going to focus around general managers, but uh, you know, hiring of a project manager is important. And you know, how do you determine uh, what what that person's job would be? And I, I suggest that you assess the skills and talents that your organizing group uh, needs and that aren't provided by the group itself. Um, you know, doing that will help you determine the focus and the job description for the project manager that you're going to hire. Uh, if you have a set of skills already in your core group or in your founding team, then you, you may not need to duplicate those skills with the project manager. Uh, but if there are skills that you're lacking, you know, and work in, in inability to do certain aspects of the organizing process, then you want to hire a project manager who has those skills and can do that, that work. Um, the challenge related to project managers are that they're very, very hard to find, and it's unique to each situation. You don't just go to the yellow pages, there's no such a thing, and um, look for project managers. And you know you have to really search and network and recruit uh, to see if you can find somebody who might be suitable for you. Uh, if you can't hire a project manager, it's important to realize that and then determine who is going to provide leadership for your group and who is going to you know, be the lead in certain areas that you've not been able to fulfill uh, to this point. So Marilyn, I'm wondering if we have any questions at this point. No, Bill, we don't have any questions uh, no. yet, but if people would like to ask a question, uh, use the, the uh, question section in the taskbar on the right of your screen. And so uh, I suggest you just go ahead now, Bill, and I'll let you know when, we, when and if we get some questions in. Okay. And uh, so, Carolee, I think we'll turn it over to you as we talk about the GM hiring process. Okay. We have a general timeline here for how long it could take to hire a general manager. Now, this will all depend on suitable candidates um, appearing in response to your advertising or, and your searching and recruiting. Uh, so it could take longer. But it's not easy for this to take any less time than four months. And even to meet this timeline, it will require that the people from your co-op who are involved in the GM search, that they are all there, all focused on getting the task done. If people are going off on vacation, going away, can't make this time, can't make that time, 
um, things can get strung out a lot, especially when it comes to conducting interviews, getting everybody together and ready to respond and be present. So we're predicating this timeline here on a search committee, and we'll go over the specific roles of a search committee in, uh, later on, but the, the people who are going to be involved, most intimately involved with the hiring have to be available and prioritizing this task to get it done in order for things to happen within this four-month timeline. Let's look at it now month by month. In the first month, the board will appoint a search committee and a chair. Sometimes the entire board wants to be the search committee, and that's fine as long as they're all available and willing to put in the time. The search committee will do a lot of the planning of the hiring process. The, uh, there is a tool that uh, I'll show you in a moment called the Qualifications Worksheet. It's available in that Hiring a General Manager workbook that we talked about at the beginning. Um, you can use uh, this worksheet or anything else you need to get clear on what you are looking for. What are the most important qualifications of the talent you seek for the general manager? That's probably the most important thing the board can do as part of this process is to get clear ahead of time about what it is that you're seeking. And then the board will approve a job description or job summary and the final qualifications, the timeline, and the budget. Let's look now at month two. OK? Yep. Um, now, this smaller group that's been tasked with the search has a lot to do here in this month. Uh, they will be placing the ads. They will be actively recruiting. They'll be um, screening candidates uh, in response to resumes and preparing for interviews, many of which will be done uh, depending on the location of the candidate. They might be done by conference call. They might be done in person. Now let's look at month three. Uh, the first round of interviews will be happening in this month. Uh, the search committee will be meeting the, this group of candidates, checking their references, deciding if we need to go back to the drawing board and seek more candidates, decide who the finalists are, and present them to the board. Here's our top choices based on uh, who's come in response to our recruitment. And they will plan in-person visits to the to the site of the store and to the uh, you know they get there from out of town that will involve planning for their travel as well. And finally, month four, uh, the search committee will do a lot of the legwork. Uh, they'll do the hosting for the visit, and they'll um, just make sure that the board get uh, is all set up to interview the finalists. The board will con will actually do the interviewing. We'll make a job offer, and we'll make the final decision. So hopefully by the end of the fourth month, you've got a general manager who's committing to a start date. OK. Let's look at the specific roles involved here. The full board of directors has the final decision. They're also setting the parameters for how the search will go. So they're agreeing on what the qualifications will be. And they will prioritize them. Which qualifications do we absolutely have to have and which would be nice to have? Uh, they will agree on the budget. And that will include the general manager's compensation. Uh, they will participate in interviews of the finalists. And they will make the decision about who to offer the job to. And they will give the search committee parameters to negotiate. And they will make the final hiring decision. They will put their stamp of approval on that. Let's look at the next slide, where the, uh, we see the search committee. This is a subgroup that's been delegated by the board. It does not have to be made up of all board members. But this group is responsible to the board and ideally would have at least some board members on it. But it does not have to be the whole board. This group is going to do a lot of the legwork. And we see here there's quite a few tasks that are spelled out for them. Um, fortunately for the search committee, there is a lot of guidance now available to help them through the process step by step. The workbook should help. And also, there are other co-ops. Um, if your co-op has a relationship with an established co-op, 
that's anywhere near yours, as many startups have been fortunate to have a sort of big sister or big brother co-op, they also might be able to provide you with some support. But nevertheless, there's quite a bit of work for the search committee to do. And a very important role with all this, let's see, is now the search committee chair. Really, groups work best when there is a leader uh, that we've all agreed upon is the leader. And in this case, the chair is the driver and keeps the momentum going. Uh, and when there, there are some tasks that a single person is needed for, such as paying for an ad um, or being the receiving point for the resumes that come in. Um, also, the search committee chair could be the one that will do some uh, phone screening of selected candidates um, before you decide whether to have a conference call or an in-person interview with them. And also, this person will be the one that will actually set up the interview times with the candidates and do that uh, task. It's very important for groups to remember you have to call the rejected candidates, too. And that's the search committee's chair's job as well. And usually, this person will check the references. So um, the chair is absolutely essential to the success of the search process. So this needs to be someone who's going to be available, who's going to be, who checks their email frequently, who can stay on top of a lot of detail and keep everybody pointed in the same direction on a project. OK. Uh, next. Uh, we don't intend for you to try to read all of the text here in this general manager uh, job description that we're posting here. That we have made a copy of this available online for all the participants. But what we want to point out here is that the general manager's job changes quite a bit once the store is open. So before the store is open, if you look at all these different tasks that the general manager is involved in, they're going to look really different uh, than, let's look at the uh, second page of it here. Um, after the store opens, the general manager's job description then becomes more uh, oriented towards what it takes to operate the store day to day. We also have a section here uh, in this list of general manager job duties of things that the general manager would not be responsible for. And this may vary with your individual co-op. This uh, list of job duties is an example that will get you thinking. But you may decide in your individual co-op that the general manager will do some things differently from what we have here. And you may decide to keep some tasks to uh, the board or committee of volunteers. Uh, the one task I think that the general manager must be free to make is the ability to hire the other staff. The general manager needs to be able to choose their team, the people that they're going to work with, and whose performance they will ultimately be accountable for. So that should not be done by a group of volunteers without the involvement of the general manager. But there are quite a few things that volunteers might do that the general manager would not. The point is to be very clear about what you're delegating to your general manager and what you're keeping among the volunteers who are getting the co-op started so that it doesn't fall into, nothing falls into the cracks about who is going to do what. OK? This is an example of the qualification priorities worksheet that Bill referred to earlier. This is a tool that is also available in the workbook. Um, I'm, for purposes of discussion here, I'm dividing qualifications into a group I'm calling the hard qualifications and another called the soft. Uh, the hard qualifications are the ones that you can pretty much verify from a resume uh, or you can, uh, or from uh, possibly references or talking to people for whom the candidate has worked. But you can say, yes, they have this experience or no, they do not. It's very important here for you to figure out for your co-op whether this person needs to have had experience with natural foods. Perhaps your co-op is going to be selling conventional as well as natural, and that would take some of the focus off natural foods industry experience. So in that case, you might decide, well, natural foods experience would be uh, highly desirable but not required. 
perhaps it would be wonderful to find someone who had had experience managing a co-op, but you might not require that experience because you they may think it could work for someone who doesn't have that kind of experience. In, uh, now we're looking at the soft qualifications, which show uh, the things that you can't determine from looking at a resume or reading a cover letter. Oh, people might claim they have this. They might say, I have great communication skills. But you don't really know that until you actually communicate with them. So these are the kinds of things that you're going to find out by getting to know a person. You get to know it some by having your first initial um, interview with them, such as um, a conference call interview with a search committee, or it might be in person if the person lives in your town. You get to know it more when they come and interact with the whole, you know, with everybody involved with the co-op. When with finalists, you get as many opportunities as possible to interact with them formally and informally. You can talk to their references. And this will give you more of a sense of who they are and whether their values do align with what you're looking for. But it's very important to recognize there's things you can tell from a resume and things you can't tell from a resume. And yet both sets of qualifications can be very important. So the work of the board at the beginning of the hiring process is to determine what is absolutely required, what we can't live without, and what would be nice to have but we could live without it, we'll consider a person without it. Carolee, um, I have a question from the audience here. Bob Noble has a question that's related to qualifications. Uh, Bob, you want to introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and ask your question? Okay, sure. Hi, Carolee and Marilyn and Bill. Um, I'm a board member from Weaver's Way Co-op in Philadelphia. And my question is, in the past, I thought uh, we looked for a new general manager in, uh, during 2003 and hired ours in 2004. And I've been peripherally involved or aware of other campaigns for uh, finding GMs. And uh, I remember something that struck me years ago, that it was important to look beyond the co-op community and, and that you couldn't expect the, to find uh, a GM by restricting your search there. And it seemed like there was a greater emphasis in, in looking outside there than, than I'm hearing today. And maybe it's just a misperception on my part, but it's seeming like it might be a higher priority to consider qualifications of uh, having experience uh, in the co-op world. Is that true? Well, Bob, that's an excellent question, uh, and I think that you are perceiving a real emphasis here. Uh, Bill and I had a discussion shortly before this seminar in which we actually went over and talked about all the startups we could think of that had hired general managers, and quite a few of them did have general managers with a co-op background, more than I would have thought possible. Uh, and I think that back when in 2003 and four when you were involved with your hiring process. And um, I would actually say this to everybody, whether your co-op is a startup or not, you must be open to people who don't have co-op background because the pool of candidates from co-ops is relatively shallow. We only have a, a couple hundred co-ops in the country, food co-ops. But um, the fact is that if a startup, uh, Bill made the point earlier that for, um, let's see, can we go back to the, previous slide, Bill, the hard qualifications. Uh, the, um, for a startup, Bill made the point that it may be even more important to have co-op experience than it would for an established co-op. And that uh, I've, and my, even more important to have the most directly relevant experience we can find for a startup than it is for an established co-op. And I think that I would stand with that. I, I would back that up, too that um, it, but for a startup, you have to have someone who's pretty clear on the concept of what you're trying to do. When you have a well-established co-op that's been going for a long time, the way Weaver's, was, Weaver's Way was when you were recruiting, uh, you can bring someone on board. They can get turned on to the co-op idea. They bring all this wealth of business experience with them. And as long as their values align with the co-ops, which is what happened in your case, you found someone who hadn't managed the co-op, but his values did align with the co-op values. He was very excited about the co-op idea. And he brought all this previous business experience. That worked out very well for Weaver's Way. For a startup, 
Um, I'm thinking that if you can find someone who has uh, some co-op background, that might be even more important than for an established co-op. But your point is still very well taken that you can't count on finding it because we don't have a really huge pool to draw on to begin with. So in the qualifications worksheet, you might say for cooperative management experience that it's highly desirable. Uh, you know, it might not be required. Yeah, I, I think is the way I would think of it in most situations. But ultimately, Bob, I think your perception is correct that when you when you were involved in doing your hiring, you were hearing that from me and other people. You need to be open to outside of the co-op world, and I would still maintain that's true for an established co-op. Well, and I'd say it to a startup as well. You have to be open. Yeah. But but um, fortunate, some startup co-ops have been very fortunate in finding people who do have co-op background, and that seems to have worked well for them. You know, in Weaver's Way made a very good hire, and uh, you know, they were open to looking to somebody outside of the food co-op sector. Um. Okay, thanks very much. If there are any other questions, just type them into the chat box. But for now, I think we're all set. Okay, Bill, let's move ahead to compensation. Now, you have to think about the uh, range of compensation that you will be prepared to pay a general manager so that you can budget appropriately here. And this is not easy to determine, but um, I want you to remember when you're thinking about compensation to not only think about the monthly salary that a person gets, but also to think about whether there would be any bonus and to think about benefits as well. And benefits can run roughly somewhere between 20 and 25% of base salary. And by benefits, I'm also counting the payroll taxes, which involve the, shall we say, government-required benefits that uh, are provided, uh, that like Social Security and uh, unemployment compensation and so on. So. Um, I would say if you budgeted 25% for those benefits, that would be pretty safe. Okay. For uh, finding out what that base salary would be, there are three sets of data to look at. One is what other co-ops are paying. Another is what your local labor market is paying and what qualified candidates want. Now, you can't know about point number three when you're setting your budget until you actually have candidates. But you can research what other co-ops are paying and what the local, local labor market is paying. And then when you find out what your qualified candidates want, then that's useful to know in terms of your negotiating. For what other co-ops are paying, there are now some tools available. They're not avail necessarily available to the public to find out what other co-op managers are paying, but you can ask co-op consultants who do have um, access to these tools that can give you some information on what co-ops of a certain size are paying their general managers. The local labor market, though, is very, very important. Um, I'm thinking about the difference between Billings, Montana, and Santa Monica, California. Both of them have co-ops. Uh, both of them ask me uh, for information about what to pay a general manager. The difference in the cost of living is uh, so extreme that uh, the, it, in Billings, what you would need to pay someone to be a livable wage to be able to cover the costs of, of uh, you know, housing and food and transportation and medical care and so on in Billings, Montana, is something like, um, it, it's like one third of what you would have to pay somebody in Santa Monica, California to cover the same things. So, there's a huge difference, and you do have to take that into account as well. So your local, local labor market is really important. The federal government does provide, uh, through the Bureau of Labor Statistics, does provide data online where you can look that up. I wouldn't call it extremely user-friendly, but a person who's being persistent and paying attention can sort it out for themselves. Also, you may have other local sources of data, such as your Chamber of Commerce, um, or your um, state uh, employment security commission may have information based you know, for your county and, and your state and your city and so on. 
but it's just important to consider that. If you live in a very high cost area, you probably know that. If you live in California, you can pretty much assume that uh, whatever you would need to pay, um, it's going to be more than somebody in Indiana or Michigan or Oklahoma is you know, needs to make a living. So we do have to keep these things in in consideration. There's also some really good tools available on the web for being able to compare what it costs to live in one area to another area. Uh, so you, you will do this juggling act of trying to figure out, okay, what are co-ops paying? What's the local labor market paying? Then as part of your screening with the candidates you're interested in, you can ask them what their needs for compensation are and they will tell you, and they will often say that they don't want to be pinned down to one number, you know, that they're open to other considerations, but if they want $100,000 a year and you've been thinking it's going to be more like 40 to 50, they're probably not going to be able, that you probably don't have a match there. So you can find out fairly early on in the process. Also, some of the internet job boards that uh, where you might post an ad will require you to say what your salary range is, and that also will help to um, screen people to see what they can afford. Okay, uh, just a couple of points we wanted to make here. You want a timeline, even if you can't stick to it, you may have to change it, and it's very important once you have candidates in your system, once they start coming to you to let them know when they can expect to hear back from you next. The feedback I get from general manager candidates of co-ops is that that's the uh, most frustrating part for them is when they're left in the dark. Uh, and then we have a couple other points here, like using a script for your interviews. Of course, not all written out word by word, but at least some questions that you're going to follow in a certain order. and. Um, to keep any references that you may get confidential because other employers, to give you a reference, do take some risk of um, not a high one, but it's still there, of being sued for defamation. So you must treat their references with the greatest confidentiality. Okay. So, Bill, you want to take it here? Well, yeah. Um Maybe we'll check to see if we have any questions, Marilyn, before we move into the kind of promotion and recruiting. Uh, no, we don't at the moment. Okay, we must be. I don't think we could be answering everybody's questions, but anyway, um, I think it's really important. It is a part of the hiring process is to think of of you're going to have to really go out and promote uh, yourself to, and and you're going to have to recruit. To, to find the really good candidates. And so some possible um, ways to think of the, the benefits of this job and some of them being intangible, uh, you know, you need to look, think through these things in terms of what, you know, a general manager position has to offer um, in terms of autonomy and career advancement, in terms of the, the special community nature of food co-ops, uh, and, and then the challenge, uh, and a lot of people are attracted. Not a lot, but <laughs> I think your your good candidates will be attracted to the particular challenge that you're of a startup uh, that you have, and that they will be uh, motivated by that. And um, again, that ties in a little bit to uh, not exclusively, but to the people who have experience with food co-ops and have maybe managed an existing established food co-op but are attracted to the challenge of co-op development and helping a new co-op get started. Uh, that there is a board of directors, a dedicated and supportive board. Um, that the you know the current state of the economy might mean that this is a good time for this type of a of a job, uh, both in that that cooperatives are are doing quite well. Um, during this, this economy and the people's values are pointing in the direction of the shared values of food co-ops. Uh, and then I think a large factor is to look at the whole support and network and resources that is available from the food co-op community. And uh, it's a very type, different type of job than a, than a corporate job or a, being a, um, 
a manager of a, in a chain store, um, you won't have the type of support that you have in a chain store on one hand, but you'll have a different type of support that is available from the food co-op community. Uh, eventually, hopefully your co-op will be able to be a member of the National Co-op Grocers Association, and there's a, a, a strong uh, level of support available there. So beginning to think of what you have to offer, and, uh, and then uh, Carol Lee will talk in a little bit about how you begin to present yourself. But I like to, as I've worked with groups uh, in hiring general managers, both uh, established food co-ops and startups, I really encourage them to use a, a technique that I want to describe here a little bit uh, in terms of it's basically a brainstorming technique emphasizing recruitment. And I distinguish between recruitment and advertising. And that advertising is where you're, you know, you're placing ads, you're putting flyers up, you're, you know, you're, you're promoting in a, in a broad way. But with recruitment, you're uh, you're you're narrowing that, and you're being active, um, and you're you're going personally and specifically. You're recruiting specific people, and I believe it's really essential. And you may not get you you may get your candidate from the broader advertising, but I would say in um, more than half of the cases, you're going to get them from the specific recruitment. And so you say, how do you do this when you don't know who you would recruit? Well, anybody can do this, is my belief. And it's a, it's a practice and a discipline. But to create two lists, and in list number one, that you uh, come up with 10 names of desired candidates for the general manager job. And you will maybe stare at the page, and you will don't know who you're going to put in there. But you have to come up with 10 names. And in brainstorming, there's no judging. There's no right or wrong answers. But you want to come up with the 10 best names that you can. So get your creative juices going and get your thinking cap on and try to figure out who might be some desirable candidates for the job. If you are not able to come up with 10 names, uh, and even if you are, even if you only come up with one name or zero names, or if you come up with nine or ten, you create a second list. And on that list, you begin to list the names, at least ten names of people to contact to find more names that you're going to be able to put onto list number one. So you keep working these two lists, and you keep adding names over um, a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, and you do active action-oriented recruiting. Uh, you pursue, you sell, and you recruit. You tell your story in a compelling way to both of these lists as you contact them. And these are contacts not so much by email, but direct by telephone. I think you want to have telephone conversations with, with the people you're going after here. Um, if you have trouble getting your 10 names for either list, Keep working at it. You can do it. And don't be discouraged by a lack of initial interest. Um, keep after the strong candidates, even if they say, no, I'm not interested. Um, kind of find out why aren't they interested. Uh, and you can eventually get to the point where you might say to them, under what conditions would you consider taking this job, or under what conditions would you consider putting in your application. You know. So that's all part of the approach to, to recruitment. And I want to add here that there's a huge difference between just seeing an announcement somewhere and having someone you know come up to you and encourage you to apply. Huge, yes. So, Carolee? <laughs> Uh, we have uh, quite a few tools now within the cooperative network. Uh, one of the best now is the CGEN Job Postings Board, uh, where you are welcome to post free announcements. 
and also the CGN listserv itself, which many co -op, uh, startup co-ops participate in. I know because I see postings from these startups all the time. And this is another good place to post an ad because there could be people who are not actively looking for a job who might find out about it here. We have Cooperative Grocer Magazine, also the National Cooperative Business Association, which is located in D.C. and it, it's an organization representing the entire cooperative sector, not just food co-ops. They also have a job board, which is free for first-time users. And then I would also encourage startups to send representatives to the annual CCMA conference with um, a, a nice brochure or handout um, and go ahead and talk among people there and find candidate, you know, potential candidates there. Okay? And that, and that conference is coming up in Bloomington, Indiana in June, what, 10th through 12th, I believe? Yeah. So you should go to that if you can. There's uh, many, there's all, all kinds of internet recruiting available for a price, uh, and there's some industry-specific ones too, such as careersingrocery.com. Uh, but your co-op's website, we want to really emphasize that because that's probably one of the most important tools. It will uh, interface with all the recruiting that you do. You want to have a website set up or a page on your website so, you, so people can go there, candidates can go there, and they can read about the opening and find out how to apply. Uh, and, of course, your own local papers. Um, and your own in-person networking, such as uh, Bill described with the brainstorming. Um, I want to show you three um, images now from another co-op. Uh, this is an established co-op, Oneota Co-op, but they were doing a general manager search. And they were one of the first to do this, I think, well. When a general manager candidate went to their website, there was a particular page they were the link they followed that brought them into this. This is their welcome page that told them about the opening and how to apply. Um, and let's go to the next one. Here they showed the board of directors. Here they are as human beings. You look at these smiling faces and say, these people I could work with. <laughs> and again, they, have, uh, they describe how the board works. They use policy governance. They describe that. And they uh, make it clear here something that people are from outside the co-op world often do not grasp, which is I, if I am a general manager of a co-op, I will be reporting to a board of directors who are elected by the membership. And they made this very clear here with this page. And then uh, finally, let's look at the third one here. Uh, where they uh, emphasize their, their uh, connection to their local community. This is becoming a really compelling idea that seems to have caught imaginations far beyond the co-op movement, with the uh, local movement. And so here they're playing up, or bring, making clear, I should say, how their co-op is going to be integral to their community and how working for the co-op is a way of supporting one's local community. So uh, I would say that your own website will become one of your most important tools for recruiting. Wherever else you place an ad, whether it's on a local website, uh, a big internet job board like monster.com, whether it's on a co-op specific one like the CGIN job board, anywhere that you make an announcement about it, put in the link and oh, Carly, go to that link. Uh, Carolee? Yeah. Do you make a distinction between, I mean, the co-op has its own regular website which also would be something that a general manager candidate would review. And this is either, this as I understand it, is, is a particular part of that. But I think the co-op should also be aware that its own website is a, is a promotional tool. Well, that's, I'm sorry, that's what I meant. I'm sorry that wasn't clear. I, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah, but this, yes. And, and, but what you're showing here looks to be, you know, specially designed for uh, yes, but it came off of the main website. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. The co-op's own website is the tool I'm talking about. And depending on how you design your website, you may a link to the part about general manager hiring. This went into a sort of 
yeah, this one went into something standalone. But the point is that, yes, it's your own co-op's website that I meant to be describing. And, and, the, full, and the full website is really a, a promotional tool. The entire thing, because of everything that it says about your co-op. Yes. Yeah. C could I jump in here with a question? Actually, I have uh, three questions from three different people, but they're all really related, and so I'm going to uh, just kind of summarize it um, on behalf of uh, uh, Dean and Bonnie and Bob. And uh, that is if you could provide some examples for how the funding for a project manager or the sources of funding for a GM salary to cover the cost of uh, hiring a, a manager. Where, what are the sources of funds? Um, the sources of funds are, are varied. Uh, in a, for a project manager, you would maybe be looking to use some of your member equity money uh, plus some fundraising, either through fundraisers that you've done or even if any grant money that you're able to, to raise or even any initial loans that you might be able to obtain. Um, and, and some co-ops have even done a, a very, what would I call it, a very informal, small member loan drive from just the first, the core group of members, for example, to raise some money initially to, uh, you know, that's certainly at risk, uh, but that could help fund the hiring of a project manager early on. Um, and as you move forward to a general manager, you know, if you're going to try to hire a general manager before all your financing is in place, uh, then you're going to be most likely, in, in addition to grants or fundraisers, you're going to be looking at using member, member equity money uh, to fund that. And hopefully not, hopefully you wouldn't have to use your main, you know, get, compilation of member loan money. Uh, let's say you've done a member loan drive and raised $400,000, uh, but you haven't crossed the final decision point yet. You, you're really committing to holding that member loan money until you get all your financing in place. So then you would look to finance through, through perhaps through member equity. Once you cross that final decision point and go into stage 3B, then you have, you know, the funding in place. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, I think that we're ready to wrap up now, uh, so I think we can uh, take it. We could just go back and uh, just look uh, very quickly here at our initial goals um, and... Uh, terms of understanding uh, when you should begin planning to hire, when you should look for hiring a project manager and a general manager, what you should look for, what is involved in the hiring process, and the importance of tools for promotion and recruitment. So you all be able to answer if that outcome has been reached, but that was our aim here. Well, good. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, Carolee, for your presentation today. Very good information. I want to remind folks that all of the webinars in this series uh, are available and the materials for them and the recording of them are available online for you to review again at your pleasure or to share with colleagues or friends or other folks you know who are involved in startups. They're available free of charge. Uh, there's also will be a very short evaluation form at the end of, of today's session. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill out those four or five questions. That will really help us. We are planning to do another webinar series uh, sometimes in the next 6 to 12 months, and so your feedback there will help us decide what topics. So thank you all for coming today and for participating in this series. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Carolee. And thank you, Joel Brock, our tech guy. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.